Um, so yeah, uh, I work at Gotham Digital Science, um, and I'm just presenting some small research project that we did uh, on wearable devices. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll just get on. Um, so yeah, I'm a consultant at GDS. Uh, we do pen testing and the other kind of services that you get at a security consultancy. CCT app, I decided to do app. Uh, not really an inf guy. I'm not a CISP. Uh, I don't really want to be one. And I like to code and I like to skateboard. Um, so just a high level agenda. Um, I just want to cover like why we should be caring about the security of our wearable devices. Um, there's lots of reasons and I'll hopefully cover those in this. Um, and then we'll try and go over and come to a conclusion about how secure our devices actually are. Um, and then again, I'd like to note that this isn't a comprehensive study, so we just had a small amount of time, um, and there's definitely more work to be done. Um, but yeah, it's just some ideas and things that we came up with. Uh, so wearable technology, it's quite big now. Um, you hear about it in the news quite a bit, and the kinds of data which are stored on our wearable devices and they, that they collect is quite a lot. So on any wearable device, you might find like social media information, uh, contacts, SMS, and just lots of information uh, about you, which you might not even realize it's collecting. So you have like fitness data, location, and lots of other things as well. Um, so uh, like where, like a lot of people do ask whether wearables are just a fad. Um, and these are just some, st some statistics I found from Ford, uh, Forbes. I didn't make them up. Um, and yeah, so it seems that wearables are being sold still and people do want them. Um, and people do report that they are more productive doing work when they're wearing them, which I think is quite interesting because that implies that people are using these for work purposes. Uh, and then you might not even realize that your company data is on these devices. Um, so that's obviously something to be concerned about. Uh, and it's been reported that smartwatches are going to lead uh, the research on the wearable market. Um, so they account for the majority of wearable sales, and that's expected to grow. So we focused our research on uh, smartwatches in particular. Um, this is just to illustrate that people wear these devices all the time. Um, like there's lots of different occasions where people are wearing these. Um, and yeah, like it, it just to illustrate that people are using it all the time. Um, so there are lots of different operating systems. Um, in the mobile space, we typically have two main contenders, which are Android and iOS. Uh, there's a lot more uh, operating systems, and it's more of a fragmented market in wearables. Um, obviously, we have Android Wear, which is based off Android. Watch OS, which is quite, is basically based off iOS. Um, and then there's some new ones like Pebble and Tizen. Um, so we, we basically looked at Android Wear mostly, and then we did touch a little bit upon Tizen. Um, but yeah, most of the work that we have looked at was using uh, Android Wear. So basically, Android Wear, uh, it's Android. Um, so it has the same kind of stack. And then there's a few little differences. So obviously, it talks to your device using Bluetooth. Um, and there are a couple of different APIs. So we've got the data API, the message API. Um, and these are basically just used to send messages between the, the paired device and uh, the wearable. So the core functionality of Android Wear is basically the same. Um, most apps for wearables seem to just use, they have like the main app on the actual device, and then the app on the wearable itself is more for just presentation. So it might give you notifications or collect some data, and then that would get sent over to the app on the smartphone, and then processing is mostly done there. But you can also have uh, apps installed directly onto the wearables themselves. Um, so like quite often as well, like you have like little games, so like you can play Snake on your watch, or uh, there's a couple of things like that. And it uses the same permission model as a traditional Android device. Um, so you have Linux file-based permissions. Each app runs as its own UID. Um, so obviously one app can't access the data directory from another app. Um, and then again, it also uses SE Linux. Um, 
and then a lot of the attack surface is very familiar. So you'll have activities, um, you're using tents for IPC, um, and you have services, and at the end of the day, it is just Android. Um, so obviously, the tools which we use, um, they're going to remain the same for the large majority. So we have things like APK tool, ADB. One interesting thing is that you can use ADB over Bluetooth, um, so you don't need to be wired in over USB, which is quite interesting. Um, like Drowser uh, is typically used on uh, Android devices, and that can also be used for Android Wear. We did have a couple of issues getting Drowser to run, um, and that's basically down to uh, a UI component which is not present on the wearable device. Um, so basically, to use Drowser, we just had to compile or build the Drowser agent uh, without the UI, and then we can just start Drowser using uh, an intent. Um, and then it works slightly differently with this as well. So then you have a reverse connection, and you have it connect back to your Drowser uh, server instead of connecting directly to the agent. But largely, it's uh, the same approach to testing uh, Android Wear. So one thing we wanted to look at was like what happens if you lose your Android Wear device. Um, so this could obviously, you could put it down, it could get stolen. Um, so on traditional Android, uh, we have various controls for uh, physical security. So obviously you have a lock screen. Uh, I'm sure most of you on your phones, you have a lock screen. Um, and on the wearable device, this isn't part of the setup of the device. So when you pair it, um, you're not prompted to set the lock screen or anything like that. So I, I think a lot of people are just not going to do that because they're a, not aware that it's present uh, and it's a, a bit of an inconvenience. Whereas on a traditional device, it's part of the initial device setup. Um, so you're more likely to actually take that uh, precaution. And another thing, uh, Android data at rest is typically encrypted. So that's one thing that we want to look at as well. Um, and then you also have some other protections like factory reset protection. So on a normal, like a modern Android device, if you just find a phone and do a factory reset, it's going to ask you to log in with uh, the previous Gmail account. And then you also have remote wiping capabilities. Um, and remote wiping capabilities aren't going to really work for this. Um, you can do it over Bluetooth, but then you'd need to be within the close proximity. So if somebody steals your device and they're somewhere like not within Bluetooth range, then you're not going to be able to wipe the device. Um, so one thing that we did, um, we were able to flash uh, custom recovery to one of the watches that we bought. Um, the bootloader was unlocked, so we were just able to do a fast boot, unlock, um, and then from there we were able to flash a, a custom recovery image. Um, and then this gave us some uh, extra flexibility when we had access to the device when it was switched off. Um, and you can see there that the timings, like, it doesn't take long to flash the custom recovery. So even if you leave your, uh, like while you're taking a shower or you've been to the gym uh, and you're getting changed, then it, the attack window for if you miss, like, place down this physical device is quite narrow. Um, so once you've got access to the physical device and you've flashed over the custom recovery image, you can see immediately we've got root to the offline file system uh, or, or the device itself. Um, one thing that is quite interesting is that in that image, the left image, it claims that secure boot is enabled. Um, I'm not sure what the secure boot on this device was because we were able to write to the system partition and the data partition. Um, so I, I'm not really sure what's secure about it. Um, but because it's Android, um, we should be encrypted. So you shouldn't be able to access the user data partition. Um, so we, we investigated this. And unfortunately, it wasn't the case. Um, we had the, the, the data partition was just completely unencrypted. Um, so a couple of ways that we can start attacking that. Um, first off, I just did a logical copy. Um, so I just tied up the data directory uh, and then pulled it off using ADB. Um, and then this took a, a matter of minutes. So the, to tar up, it took about a minute, minute and a half. Uh, and then, yeah, to pull it off, it took about another minute. So it, it's definitely a feasible attack. Um, 
And then an another option, um, so you can also DD the, the device. Um, so this will give you a full uh, image of the user data partition. Um, and in this case, it took 20 minutes to copy three gig. Um, we just piped that over Netcat, uh, and then we have a full image of the user data partition. Uh, it's quite a naive uh, image, like it's just using DD with no block size, like this could probably be brought down, but I think in the worst case, it's gonna only be around 20 minutes, and obviously, if your device has more storage, it might take a little bit longer, but I think these things can definitely be optimized. So once you've actually got the data, um, we should see what data is actually stored in those partitions. Um, and we were able to find basically everything that the device uses. Um, so you can see there, it's got what music I'm listening to, it's got Facebook messages that have been synced, it's got all of the SMS messages, it's got all of my contacts. So if you find a device or you misplace your smartwatch, then you'll be able to get all of this data, um, at least in this case. So this was, I don't know if this is the case for every smartwatch, um, but at least one of the Android Wear ones that we looked at, uh, th this was the case. Um, so other people might be using encryption, um, but this was just a short study and we found that on the device that we did look at, there wasn't encryption um, with a fully updated Android Wear. So a couple of other things. So like we said, it's a familiar uh, attack surface and it is just Android. Um, so in the core fitness app on the watch that we uh, used, it basically exposed the content provider for accessing uh, heart rate data and health information. Um, and this was vulnerable just to a, a trivial SQL injection. Um, so th there could be other vulnerabilities there, but obviously just th these, the familiar issues that we see in Android uh, carry over to Android Wear. Um, and then this was just another issue that we saw. So uh, there was a, uh, a broadcast receiver in the core Android package. Um, and if you send a specific intent to this, you can just see that everything starts to die. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure why this is happening. Uh, it needs more investigation, but it, it was strange. Um, and at the very least, it is a denial of service, um, but th there could be something else there. Um, and I don't know if this is in the Android Wear core itself or if the vendor has uh, been poking around at the code and then made a, a mistake. But when I did try to replicate the issue on a, a traditional Android device, it, it was handled safely. Um, so the other operating system that we looked at briefly was Tizen. Um, and it has a familiar kind of software stack to Android. Um, you can develop applications using uh, a web application or a native application, and you can also have a hybrid where you can p uh, use a combination of the two. Um, the web applications are HTML5 um, and JavaScript, and the native applications are just C++. Um, and yeah, they expose various APIs for this. Uh, so this is the just uh, application structure. So it's quite similar to Android. Like in Android, you're in slash data, slash data, and then you have a package ID, um, which would be something like com.google.myapp. Um, and we have a similar kind of layout in uh, Tizen. Um, so instead of an APK file, uh, the native applications themselves, they use uh, a TPK format. Um, and then we can see that the web application structure is quite similar as well. Um, like you have your apps and then your package ID, and then you basically have your HTML content and then a symlink to the actual web runtime. Um, and for the web runtime, they're using WebKit. Um, so we all know that WebKit's reasonably secure, but so like if you just look at the CVEs, there's at least 230. Um, so while like there isn't any from this year, it's definitely something to look at. Like if bugs do pop up on WebKit, then these could potentially be exploited on uh, Tizen devices. Um, and, and this is not just on smartwatches, so Tizen's used for TVs, phones, um, and they're trying to push it out on more devices. Uh, so with the web API, um, in Android, if you for example, have a web view and you want to access device functionality, you need to use the add JavaScript interface. Um, and you don't need to do that in Tizen. Uh, so basically you have device APIs 
Um, and this allows you to access everything that you would access using the native API, but from JavaScript. Um, so you don't, like developers don't need to be C++ programmers. Uh, if they just know JavaScript, then they can still develop for these devices. Uh, so basically on the Tizen security model, um, it's basically the applications, they don't run as root, they run under the app user. Uh, and then instead of using SE Linux, they have a, a thing called SMAC, um, which is the simplified mandatory access control kernel. And it basically does the same job. Um, so instead of having like a separate UID for each process, uh, each app runs as the app user, but then it has a SMAC label um, and these labels can be used to distinguish between, uh, to stop one app from communicating with another. Um, the application signing is slightly different as well. So with Android, uh, your application would typically only be signed by the developer. In this case, it's signed by the, both the developer and the distributor. So each store um, would then sign this themselves. Um, and then, yeah, so as I said, it's using Smack instead of SC Linux. Uh, and this is just basically how Smack works on a very high level. So you have uh, Smack rules uh, with Smack labels, um, and they're defined by a subject, an object, uh, and the access rights that you want. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail, um, but it was just important to cover the difference between uh, Android using SC Linux and uh, Smack using, uh, Tizen using Smack. Uh, so there are um, a lack of tools really for Tizen. Um, so we don't have the the breadth of capabilities that we do in Android. Um, Samsung do have a thing called the SDB, which is the equivalent of ADB. Um, so you basically set up your, AD, uh, your SDB server uh, on the device, you go through in the settings and then you enable it and then you can connect to it over TCP IP. Um, and then you get a limited shell on the device. Um, and this can be used for installing packages, uh, removing things, and just general uh, development tasks. A couple of tools which I was able to find. Uh, so there were some manifest parsers. Uh, they just basically parse the manifest, tell you about the different components, um, and what permissions uh, the application uses. Um, and then I was also to f able to find a, a TPK decompiler which says that it can uh, decompile uh, the native uh, Tizen applications back to pseudo C or uh, assembly code. And then obviously any, it's an ARM, like in this case it was an ARM processor. So any tools which you can run on ARM or compile for ARM, you can push over using SDB uh, and you can run these. So you, we were able to get GDB, BusyBox, uh, TCP dump, um, like any, typical tools that you might use for looking at a, a Linux operating system. But it was clear that there are more tools required because um, th there really wasn't much there. Um, so for future work, we definitely need to uh, review the Tizen ecosystem in more detail. So there's not been too much work there. Um, like you've probably seen in the news that a guy uh, a couple of weeks ago came out with some issues. Um, so there definitely, there's probably bugs there um, and they need to, we need to be looking at this in more detail, especially if we're putting the uh, Tizen OS on more devices. Um, looking at the watch OS, um, that's something that we'd also like to do. Um, developing more tools for Tizen is definitely something which sh should be done in the future too. Um, and look at the other Android Wear components and devices. So seeing if the issues that we saw on the device we tested uh, prevalent across the majority of Android Wear devices or if it was just the vendor that we picked um, had got stuff wrong. Um, so just to conclude, uh, the wearable devices that we see today, they don't seem to be as well secured as their mobile counterparts. Um, it seems to be at least a couple of years behind compared to what we see in uh, gener general mobile security. Um, more work is really required to assess how secure our wearable devices are. Uh, in the limited time we did have, uh, we were able to see that there was definitely some issues in the devices that we picked. Um, 
and yeah, wearables definitely don't seem as uh, mature and they seem to be lacking behind other device, uh, the mobile space. Um, but yeah, that's uh, all from this. So I'd just like to say thanks. Um, and if anyone's got any questions, then I'm welcome to hear them.